All right. Hey, good morning, church. How's everyone doing? We picked a really hot day to go outside, but so be it. Hey, we're going to be outside for uh, the month of August, so I uh, hope you join us out here every Sunday. I uh, hope you enjoyed if you got an Italian soda. Thanks to the Mastels for making those, or uh, cold brew coffee. It's kind of cool. Uh, but we're going to get started. Let me just tell you how this will work. We have a lot of kids here right now, and that's great. So we want them to stay and sing with us. Uh, then we, um, after we're done singing here, uh, we have a couple of our, I guess they're not in college anymore. A couple of our young adults are going to do a skit for the kids, but also for you adults. You can uh, enjoy as well. Uh, and then we'll take the kids out of here. Um, they'll go over and do some class stuff. Uh, today, Pastor Jeff is preaching. Uh, he'll take us through Romans 11. Uh, and then we'll sing a little bit more at the end and be done with church outside. So that's kind of the direction we're going today. Uh, secondly, update. Thanks for praying for my family. We finally got out of the hospital. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, this past Tuesday with baby Tucker. I don't know where he's at. Are they by this? Oh, right. <laughs> my family's right there. Uh, so if you haven't met Tucker, you can meet him. Uh, he was born almost two weeks ago. Uh, we were in the hospital for like eight days. Uh, he had a lot of blood sugar problems, and but he's okay, and we're home, and we're thankful to finally have broken out of that place. I was beginning to suffocate uh, inside of there, but it's good to be out, so say hi to Tucker. Thanks for praying. I know many of you are praying. A lot of people uh, send me messages and stuff, so thankful for that. Thankful to be a part of uh, this church family. All right. Hey, let me, uh, let me pray for us. I'm going to hand it over to Jason to lead worship, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll do church together. Let's pray. God, thank you for the opportunity that we get to gather outside in the sun today in Oregon. Uh, I just pray, God, you bless this time as we sing, uh, as Jeff preaches. Um, God, would you just, uh, uh, just be glorified in this place. Thank you for this church. Thank you for what you're doing in this church. Uh, I pray that um, we'd really just um, experience you today, um, but also learn and grow as a result of this time. Thank you, God. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. For anyone who needs lyrics, they'll be on the sheet uh, that you should have been given when you came in. So if you need to go grab that, you're welcome to jump out of your seat right now. See 
sing all that again. Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away. Hosanna. Hosanna. You are the I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left. And they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. So after pointing out Israel's failure to believe in the preceding couple chapters, a natural question arises here. Is God finished with the people that he sovereignly chose to reach the world and bring people back into right relationship with him? As Paul so frequently does, he brings up a logical question that other people may ask, and then he answers it for them. Just a side note here, as we have opportunity to have conversations around faith and the things of God, we need to make sure that we're asking and answering questions that matter to them. You can thank Paul for that tip. But he plainly states that God is not finished with Israel. And he uses his, his, his self as an example, saying, even though the majority of Jews don't believe that he himself has been saved and that God was using him as he intended to take the good news of Jesus to the world. Saul was the persecutor of the church, but God, doesn't, God was not done with him. He became the apostle to the Gentiles. He says in verse 2 that God had not rejected the people whom he foreknew. The word in Greek is progenosko, all right? A compound word formed from pro, which means before, and gnosko, which means to know. So to know before or to choose before. The idea here comes with it, a personal 
intimate relationship. And that's exactly what God chose Israel for, to know him and to make him known. And then Paul goes back in time to show his readers that this this is nothing new in their history. And he used Elijah as an example here. Elijah is tired of preaching to people who wouldn't listen to him. They wouldn't respond to him. And he gets scared and runs off after confronting the king, knowing the queen is after him. He goes to hide. Elijah is discouraged. He's depressed, and he wants to give up. You ever been there? I have. He's hating on Israel for their disobedience, even in his disobedience. And he asks God to take his life. And God says, what are you doing out there, Elijah? And he tells him to go back and get to work because he still had things he wanted him to accomplish. And to encourage him, he lets Elijah know that he's not alone like he thinks he is. In fact, he has preserved and reserved seven other people, 7,000 other people that were still loyal to God. God didn't give up on him. And Elijah trained up Elisha in the last part of his ministry before he was taken away by God. I think it's funny that he asked God to take his life as he ran away from God. And God said, no, no, go back to work. But as Elijah walked into his calling and completed his mission, then God chose to spare him from death. But I'm not saying he's going to do that for you, okay? Don't get that. But Paul says, just like then, God has a remnant that are serving his purpose by grace. As God's chosen people, even after the majority had been continuously in rebellion, God still was committed to using them as he said he would. If it were dependent on their obedience, they would have been done long ago, as would we. But by God's grace, he still chose to use them as well as us. And he made promises he would keep in spite of the people. Let's keep reading verses 7 through 10. It says, What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and bend their backs forever. So Israel failed to obtain what it was looking for. Well, what was that? right standing with God. Why, though, did they fail? Because they resisted God's plan. It's persistent resistance. And when we persist in our pattern, we forfeit his prize. They had no excuse. They weren't ignorant of the facts. They just chose to continue on in their own way. But have you ever heard the saying that ignorance of the law is no excuse? That's not a valid argument. If you break the law, You're guilty of breaking the law regardless. Just because we don't know doesn't mean it's not so. So he says the elect have obtained it, but the rest were hardened. The elect were God's chosen who received right standing through grace. The elect did not reject but received by grace what God had done for them. And then we have to deal with the word harden. The Greek here means a new extra layer of hardening or callousness to petrify, creating bluntness and the loss of sensitivity. As we saw with Pharaoh's example, when we refuse to respond in faith to God and we resist and rebel against God's plans for us, he often allows and even actively participates in our hardening. It's a scary place to be. By God's mercy, this isn't necessarily a permanent condition, as we will see with the people of Israel. But then Paul quotes Old Testament scripture to back up his position here. First, a combination of Deuteronomy 29.4 as well as Isaiah 29.10, illustrating two different periods and the dulling of two different senses when speaking of the people's spiritual responsiveness to God. He says, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear. Like the Israelites, as they went through the wilderness and saw the miraculous signs and wonders, 
that God did on their behalf, but still refused to respond to God in faith. And then they heard, but again failed to respond as God's prophets delivered his message. They lost their ability to see and hear over time as God gave in to their stubbornness. It's one thing to hear, but it's another thing altogether to listen. And this spirit of stupor was punishment for their disobedience. The word stupor here means dulled or apathetic to over stimulation. We can become so accustomed to seeing God's word or seeing him work or hearing him speak that we expect it, but we don't move forward in faith. God, may this never be true for us. But then he quotes David from Psalm 69 verses 22 and 23 as David pours out his heart to God about their common enemies, asking him to cause them to be trapped to stumble, to be paid back for their evil, to darken their eyes, and then we see a new one, to bend their backs. So saying bend their backs would cause them to be focused on what they were doing and not be able to look back up to God in the grace that he wanted to offer them. The word forever there is better translated as continually, not indefinitely. But when we refuse to be moved by what God is doing in our lives and we reject his word, we're in danger of the exact thing happening in our lives. Don't fool yourself into thinking there's not long-term cumulative effects to our sin. Sin over time will make us spiritually stupid, sightless. It will stop our ability to hear. It will snare us, cause us to stumble, and make us even more stubborn as our conscience is seared and our sensitivity is lost. In chapter 1 of Romans, if you can remember all the way back to January when you guys started going through this book together, verses 17 through 32 talk about how God can and will give people up and over to their passions as they refuse his grace. God, help us to see, help us to hear, and help us to live in obedience today. We can be looking for the right thing in the wrong place and never find it. If we're looking for the wrong thing, even, in, even if the right thing is right in front of us, we'll never see it. If it's right in front of us and we're too familiar with it, we still may not see it. But when we're looking for the right thing, looking in the right place and at the right time, we will see and we will hear the truth. God is fluid. He's not static, not in character. He's unchanging in character, but by dynamic in practice, in the way that he does what he does. And we can't say we're pursuing him if what that looks like never changes our lives or even what it looks like to follow hard after him. We can't fall into the trap of thinking we know it all or fail to adjust our actions and direction when we hear his voice. Let's look at the next two verses, 11 and 12. Say this, so I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? So Paul asks if this stumble would lead to their fall. In other words, is their predicament permanent? And again, the answer is no. Because of their resistance, God offered salvation to the Gentiles in order to make them jealous. He wants to win them back. He's not through with the Jew. What has happened as a result of their rejection of God's way has resulted in good things for the world. And he says, how much more so will it be when they get in on his page and in on his plan. The situation is reversible, but it's not yet resolved. The word we translate into failure here gives the idea of losing a military battle and taking heavy casualties. The battle may have been lost, but by God's grace, the war isn't over. God is painting a picture here of hope through Paul to the Jews in Rome. Failure wasn't final. By God's grace, our failure can lead 
to his fullness for us and for others if we'll learn the lesson. Let's look at the next two verses, 13 and 14. Now I am speaking to you Gentiles, and as much then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. Now Paul is talking directly to the Gentiles in the church as the church was made up of both Gentiles and Jews in Rome. He tells them that even though he was sent by God to reach them, he still has a heart for the Jewish people, and he wants to use them to make them jealous so that the Jews might return to God. It's pretty bold of Paul, but Paul was pretty bold, and it was true. But this is the second time we see the word jealous here, the first time in verse 11. So let's take a minute to talk about that word. We often think of that word in a negative context, maybe almost exclusively in our culture. But when we see it in scripture, that's not the case at all. God is a jealous God. He wants the, the attention and he wants the worship of his people. He won't share his glory with anyone. And here Paul talks about using Gentiles to make Jews jealous because God isn't finished with them. He wants to provoke the Jews to return to him by seeing the benefits that the Gentiles are enjoying. All right. Paul talks about magnifying his ministry to make much of it, to expand it or increase the focus on it to accomplish good. It's OK to be used for good. That's what God wants to do with all of us. In fact, that's what God is doing through all of us. God can use loss to point people to the cross and others good to help be understood. I want you to think about this for a minute. What does somebody else have that you are jealous of? Don't say it out loud. I don't want to embarrass anybody. But when you have something, raise your hand. Do you have something? I have something. Anybody? Anybody? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good, good, good. Next question. What do you have that other people are jealous of? Got anything? I do. It's my wife. But this is the question. Did either of the answers you came up with have to do with faith? Someone's relationship with God. Is there anyone that you know who is jealous of your faith? And whatever the answer is, this is the next question. Why do you believe that to be true? God wants us to live in a way that others would see the relationship we have with him and be jealous because of it. God wants people to want what we have. And we should want other people to want what we have. People only want what we have if it's good, though, if it's transparent, if it's authentic, if it makes us different. People not only want to be around that kind of faith, but they want that kind of faith for themselves. It's a faith that encourages and doesn't criticize. It's a faith that has a sense of humor and isn't dull. It's a faith that takes risks and doesn't hold back. It's a faith that is generous and not selfish. It's a faith that is loving and not apathetic. It's a faith that is about what it's for and not about what it's against. That is an attractive faith, and that is true faith. I wonder if it's your brand of faith. If it's not, it can be. Let's determine to make somebody jealous this week with the quality of our faith. Paul's not done, but we're getting close, so let's continue. Verses 15 to 16. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. This isn't a servant sermon on giving, but if you look hard enough, there's one there. You guys can let me know if you get that later, okay? But God doesn't waste anything, does he? 
He doesn't waste anything. The Jews' rejection of Jesus led to the Gentiles being made right with God. And their acceptance of him will bring even more new life. So what began with Israel benefited the entire world. And Paul talks about the dough that they would offer through the first fruits sacrifice in the Old Testament. You can find that in Numbers chapter 15. And he says this first act of giving to God would affect the whole batch. And then that the branches that come from a holy root would also produce holy branches. And this reference was to the patriarchs of Israel who followed God by faith and the current future or future Jews who would choose to believe. On to verses 17 through 24 as we land this plane. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For God did not spare the natural branches. Neither will he spare you. Know then the kindness and severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back in to their own olive tree? There's lots of you who are gardeners and horticulturalists that would understand this much more than we have the time to go into. But Paul is explaining here that the Gentiles were only able to be part of God's kingdom and people through the chosen nation of Israel. He warned them not to be proud in verse 18 and then again in verse 20 and fall prey to what happened to the Jews themselves. We have to realize that we aren't special. We're just given a gift that God wants to give everyone. He wanted the Jews and the Gentiles to be united in Jesus as they shared the same faith and then lived on mission to reach the world as partners, knowing that it was all by God's grace that they were included. And God is dealing with the Gentiles as a group here. He's not saying that they could lose their salvation. This is not only through, it's not only through faith that we're saved, it's also by faith that we live for him. It's only on the basis of belief that anyone is accepted by God. And we should be aware and stand in awe of him in his kindness, as well as his sternness, as he uses both to draw people to himself. And finally, God was leaving the door open for the Jews to come back to him. If they turn from their unbelief, he said, I will welcome them home. And that's exactly what will happen. He wasn't done with them yet. And you may be here today and wonder if you're too far gone because of something that you've done. You may be wondering if God's love, grace, and forgiveness is available to you. Maybe you've never trusted God because you've lived like the Jewish people and trusted in what they could do. Maybe you're to the point where you realize it's a dead-end road. It's left you worn out. It's left you weary, defeated, and without hope. Or maybe you're a believer that has wandered away from the faith and chosen to go your own way. And you've realized maybe through some severe consequences in your life that you've gotten off track and you want to come back home. If that's you in either of these scenarios, I have good news for you. God's not done with you. He hasn't given up on you. Just like with Israel, the door is open for you to come back home. You don't believe me? I want you to think about Samson, who was used greatly by God, but his lust and his pride got him in trouble. He lost his strength, his sight, in his hair all in the same day. And he could have been finished. 
the story could have ended as a cautionary tale. But God wasn't through with Samson. On his final day, he reached back out to God and he brought the house down, doing more damage to the enemies of God than he did the rest of his entire life. If you've let lust run your life, or you felt the pain of pride, God can and still wants to use you too. Or how about Jonah? He was God's man, chosen for God's plan, to share God's message with people he hated. And so he took off and ran as fast as he could the other way. God could have let him go, but instead he met him where he was going. Jonah could have been done after so deliberately disobeying God, but he cared too much about Jonah and the people that he wanted to use Jonah to reach. The results, a runaway that could have been thrown away, was used to help save an entire city from certain destruction. All because God was not finished with him yet. If you've been running from God or what he's called you to do, if you've let hate keep you from being used, God's not done with you either. Or consider Peter who spent three years with Jesus. He was one of his closest friends. He so let fear control him that he disowned Jesus on the night he was arrested. Not once, not twice, but three different times. His betrayal was so severe he thought he was finished in ministry. So he went back to fishing. And when you go back to your old ways, you always come up empty. And that's exactly what happened to Peter. But his story wasn't over because God wasn't done. Jesus showed up on the shore to welcome Peter back and set him back on his path. And now fearless Peter preached and reached thousands for the kingdom as he helped lead the church. All because God wasn't done with him. So if you've let fear keep you from following Jesus, today is your day to let it go. And maybe that's not where you find yourself today, but maybe you know someone who is far from God and God wants to use you to reach them because he's not done with them yet. Maybe it's someone that you've already given up on because you think it's been so long or they're too far gone. I want you to know today, just as you were worth fighting for, so are they. God didn't give up on you, and he's not going to give up on them. So pray, invest, reach out, serve, bless, share, and see what God does with your obedience. I'm going to finish with this. This is for all of us, no matter where we may find ourselves today. Three things that we can take away. One, embrace grace. Be humble because you were invited and invite someone else. Number two, continue in kindness. Be grateful that you were included and include someone else. Three, make peace with the mystery. Be aware of what God is doing around you and don't ignore how he wants to use you. Take action on what you know and be okay with what you don't. Sorry, Brian, I stole the last one from verse 25, which will be part of what he's doing next week. I'm sure you're going to hear more about that as he finishes up chapter 11 for us. Let's pray together. Father, thanks for today and for this time together. Thanks for your word that we can count on. Thanks that you give us each other to encourage and be accountable to. Thank you that you don't leave us alone, that you don't throw us away, and that you're not finished with us yet. Help us to lean into you and how you want to use us. Give us courage to step up and step out and move forward in faith as we follow after you. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue in worship, I invite you to respond to God. If you need to talk about a decision that you've made or have questions about the faith, we would love 
to have that conversation. Find a staff member or a college leader before you leave campus this morning. Let's stand as we respond in worship. good, you are good, when there's nothing good in me, you are love, you are love, on display for all to see, you are light, you are light, when the darkness closes in, you are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin.
righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Come together. Come together, sons and daughters. Spirit, Son, and Father, our God, we'll finish what He started. Yes, our God, we'll finish what He started. This is my testimony from death to life. His grace we wrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm just a guy. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Let's affirm these words together, church. Here we go. If I'm not dead, you're not die. Greater things are still to come. And if I'm not dead. God, we just thank you uh, for the chance that we have to worship you outdoors um, this morning to do something a little bit different, um, but to still gather as a body of believers. I um, just pray that you would um, just continue to help us uh, live according to your word this coming week, that many uh, would come to know you um, as a result of the way that we live our lives uh, for you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So great to worship with all of you. We've got a great God. See you same time, same place next week.